हेलो फ्रेंड्स गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग गुड आफ्टरनून एंड गुड इवनिंग टू ऑल माई सेल्फ अक्षय कुमार वाई एच एयर एशरे चंडीगढ़ चैप्टर वेलकम टू दिस वेबिनार ज्वाइंटली ऑर्गेनाइज बाय एशरे चंडीगढ़ चैप्टर एशरे पुणे चैप्टर एंड एशरे डेकन चैप्टर आई एम श्योर यू ऑल आर अवेयर अबाउट एशरे तो एशरे इज द American Society of Heating, Refrigerating, and Air Conditioning Engineers. This society uh, is seeking to advance heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and refrigeration system design and construction. Ashra has more than fifty-seven thousand members in more than one thirty-two countries worldwide. Its members are composed of building services engineers, architects. mechanical contractors building owners equipment manufacturers employees and other concerned with the design and construction of hvac and r system in buildings the society fund research projects offers continuing educational programs and develop and pu uh, publishes technical standards to improve building services engineering uh, energy efficiency indoor air quality and sustainable development so Uh, if you are ashray member then it's a very good if you are not then please be a part of ashray uh, by register yourself at online at uh, ashray joint.ashray.org now again i welcome to uh, this webinar so today is our 21st webinar on sustainable infrastructure for communities uh, now uh, ashray code of ethics in this and all other ashra meetings we will act with honesty fairness courtesy competence inclusiveness and respect for others which exemplify our core values of excellence commitment integrity collaboration volunteerism and diversity and shall avoid all real or perceived conflict of interest now moving further now i would like to introduce the ashray distinguished lecturer mr daniel h nell he is a uh, today's presenter uh, and he is a professional engineer fellow ashray fellow aia uh, he is a certified uh, building energy modeling professional and he high performance building design professional he is from usa now moving to the explain uh, so this is a uh, full biography of the mr daniel hnell uh, mr nell is a graduate of preston university cornell university he is registered architect a professional engineer and ashray life fellow a fellow of uh, aia a lead fellow a certified building energy modeling professional high performance building design professional and a certified passive house consultant ashray activities include the ashray Adv uh, advanced energy design guide steering committee here of spc uh, 227 the passive building standard the building energy uh, quotient doc and oversight committees and tc 4.7 he helped author the 30% advanced energy design guide for small office building small retail buildings road side uh, lodging and small warehouses and the 50% aedg uh, for medium office building medium and big box retail buildings and grocery stores and the zero energy guide for k12 school uh, small and medium office buildings and multi family residential building he was recipient of the ashray distinguished service award and new york chapter uh, ashray distinguished service award he has been a faculty member at the school of architecture at the university of pennsylvania princeton university cornell university and columbia university now i want to uh, do a little announcement the recording of this webinar will be uploaded on our youtube channel please subscribe our youtube digital channel ashray chandigarh and the question and answer will be done at the end of this session you can ask your questions by 
typing in chat box and same will be answered at the end by speaker now i request to mr nal please presentation your presentation over to you sir Okay, I saw the note to share my screen, but it did not um, uh, allow me to select which screen to share. Uh, you may just share the presentation screen. That the presentation here in the PowerPoint. Yes. Uh, can you please open it? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Here it is. Uh, you can select it. Yes. Okay, can you see that? Uh, wait a minute, let me switch this. Yes. All right. I'm sorry, the um, uh, PowerPoint only will display on my second screen. Um, so when I hit this, it goes to the second. And and you're seeing you're seeing the secondary screen, are you not? Not the first yeah. screen. No, no, first screen. Uh, we are we are able to see both the screens. No, no. Uh, so we are we're just able to see the first screen. What you have to do is uh, try to, um, you know, just stop sharing the screen and uh, restart sharing your screen and see if it is uh, if if it uh, asks you. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Share. Or uh, in your laptop, if you could just, uh, you know, change your setting to duplicate the screen then uh, the second screen will not op uh, appear yeah, there is no duplicate option. so yeah uh, you can go to the display settings and then see if it allows you to duplicate that's there on the top okay on top <clears throat> you display settings the yeah, center of the screen on the top good. just besides the end slideshow what to do. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, it would be better if you can use the PDF version of this file. Okay, wait, did I, this do it? No idea of what to do for this. Better to use PDF version of this file. I'm sorry, I, I can't hear you very well. Yeah, better to use PDF version of this file. PDF version. PDF. Well. Mm. 
Okay, I'm just going to do it this way since I can't, and rather than, is this okay? Uh, uh, Mr. Dan, we are not able to see your screen. Can you please share your screen again? Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yes, yes, yes. It's okay, so I, rather than use PowerPoint yeah. in the uh, projection mode, I'm just going to use it in the standard mode because uh, I can't uh, I can't get it to project. It always projects on my second screen, and I, I could not figure out how to make um, this uh, uh, webinar uh, uh, show share my second screen rather than my first screen. So I'll just do this, okay? Yeah. All right. Sorry for all the um, all of this confusion. It's uh, these are different times, and we're all learning new skills. And unfortunately, I have not learned all the necessary skills uh, uh, for uh, using GoToMeeting. So uh, I'm I'm getting pretty good at Zoom, but uh, uh, this one uh, uh, I'm not so good at yet. Anyway, the topic of today's uh, uh, presentation is sustainable infrastructure for green communities. Um, I'm the presenter. Uh, these, um, this presentation is uh, accredited uh, for both American Institute of Architects Continuing Education and GBCI Continuing Education. <clears throat> The number or the uh, for getting American Institute of Architects accreditation is right here. Um, this shows that ASHRAE is a registered provider. This is also approved by GBCI. So the course ID is right here and you can self-report on the GBCI website to get one hour of general continuing education credit for this presentation. These materials are copyrighted. The course description. Community planners have the opportunity for significant reduction of the environmental impact of human activity. Communities can be vital complex ecologies that obtain maximum use of consumed resources while minimizing waste discharge. These goals are best achieved by exploiting the synergies among the separate infrastructure systems while obtaining multiple benefits from each conservation strategy. For example, greenways can provide not only pedestrian pathways, but also management and cleansing of stormwater runoff, co-location of neighborhood scaled power thermal and wastewater treatment plants allows the byproducts of each system to be used as resources for the other systems. Pursuing these issues at a community level addresses issues at the most effective scale. Renewable energy production, on the other hand, is best handled on a regional scale so that sites can be selected for most effective harvesting of the resource. When these strategies are pursued in a single building, both conservation and economic effectiveness are often seriously diminished. The learning objectives for this course. At the end of the course, the participants will be able to recognize scale issues in the implementation of sustainable and alternate energy technologies and community development planning. Analyze potential synergies among various community infrastructure systems and integrate infrastructure systems with physical plans to maximize sustainability. Develop conceptual strategies for water and energy efficiency at a community scale. Recognize issues related to the role of community planning for global sustainability. Our ASHRAE slides, urging you to complete the uh, Distinguished Lecturer Event Summary Critique at the end of the presentation. It's available online, I believe, and urging you to volunteer for ASHRAE. <clears throat> what is the scale of this opportunity for sustainable infrastructure? If we look at today's buildings and cities, they, 
They create 30% of the global greenhouse gas emissions, 30%, 33% of the global resource consumption, 12% of the global fresh water use, 40% of the global solid waste production, and 10% of the global workforce is employed in urban areas. Urban areas present the opportunity to design not just the architectural solution, but the architecture of how to get to the solution. This requires a strategic mindset applied to systems thinking at the scale of the city. We look at uh, the process of urbanization and how it's proceeding. 120 years ago, uh, the population of the earth was uh, 1.7 billion and only 10% of the people lived in urban areas. When we look at the projections for 2050, we see that the projected uh, global population is 9 billion people and 75% of those people will live in urban areas. <clears throat> we can characterize the 21st century as the urban age. Metro regions are 2% of the world's surface and generate 80% of the world's wealth. <clears throat> Over 5% of the world's population live in 23 mega cities around the world, each with population of more than 10 million persons. There are now 400 cities with populations over a million. A century ago, there were only 16. Greater Mumbai has more people than Norway and Sweden put together. Sao Paulo is the same size as Australia. These uh, statistics are in fact old, and, and in fact the process of urbanization likely has proceeded even farther since these statistics were generated. <clears throat> Global population will grow almost a third by 2044 to 9 billion people. That many people will need far more resources than exist on the planet. Global energy demand is expected to soar 44% in the next two decades. In 15 years, 1.8 billion people will live in regions of severe water scarcity, and two-thirds of the world population are, uh, will live in areas of stressed water conditions. Traffic is a global problem. Many of the world's cities are completely <coughs> stifled by automobiles attempting to get from place to place uh, their daily travels, uh, commuting to work, shopping, etc. The problem is, is that uh, um, our non-renewable resources uh, are decreasing as we use them up, and we're going to need to rely more on uh, renewable resources to meet our needs. So when we think about the process, uh, too often um, the wrong process is, uh, is, is followed. We need to identify opportunities, not specific solutions. Too often, uh, individuals come forward with, I know the way to save the world, and this is it. This is the specific solution. We need to keep an open mind. There will not be a single specific solution that will save the world. We need to emphasize the goals and not the means. Too often, we become fixated on a particular pathway and lose sight of the goals that we're trying to achieve. We need to emphasize strategies, not technologies. So often we hear people say, well, we can fix it all by everyone going solar. Well, solar energy may be a part of the solution, but it is not the single solution. So we need to look at strategy. The strategy is to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions, to focus on various types of renewable energy, and not to fixate on a single technology.
and we need to find synergistic, multidisciplinary design alternatives. The solution or the world's problem will not be a single solution. It will be, in effect, sort of the death by a thousand cuts. A number of different uh, individual strategies uh, working together in a synergistic fashion to create a better world. The goals, I think we can all agree on the goals. We're, we're looking at the creation of livable, uplifting human environment for all of the world's citizens. We're looking at the restoration of habitat, restoration and renewal so that the natural ecosystems can continue to maintain the world's environment as we have uh, grown in and which we need for our survival. Obviously, uh, we need to look at carbon emissions reduction. We need to look at recharging the aquifers around the world. We look at, we need to create clean, healthy watersheds. We need to look for optimized infrastructure support and we need to create economic value. As I said, strategies, not technologies. So strategies include dense building and extensive green space, pedestrian accessible amenities, transit pedestrian accessible work to home, solving the last mile problem for urban transit, community centered utilities if possible, optimized renewable energy sources, energy efficient individual buildings, utilization of non-potable resources. I'm going to demonstrate that much of the water that's used by human beings doesn't need to be drinkable. Stormwater management with detention and percolation to renew the aquifer and efficient re uh, utilization of solid waste, treating solid waste as a resource, not as a plague. We need to recognize the synergies, the interlocking cascading systems how green space, stormwater management, and non-potable water utilization uh, interact and support one another, how dense building, pedestrian circulation, and transit utilization um, influence uh, and amplify one another, looking at how community scale utilities, particularly wastewater treatment, enable greater utilization of non-potable water resources look at community and building energy planning, community scale utilities, and optimized renewable energy sources and how they amplify one another. One of the problems that we have is we often look at the wrong scale for implementation of some of these solutions and technology. So for example, on a regional scale, Offshore wind farms are very effective. Photovoltaic farms are solar thermal generation. Uh, inner city fast rail to supplant airplanes and automobiles. On a city scale, waste pyrolysis plants with carbon shark sequestration. Real-time energy pricing for market response load management to enable our electric grid to um, better respond to the needs of its customers, and urban transit to avoid the need for automobiles in the urban center. On a neighborhood scale, looking at local wastewater treatment with effluent irrigation of parks and provision of cooling tower makeup for district cooling, mixed use zoning to improve pedestrian access. And on a building scale, look at things like microturbine cogeneration for domestic hot water. Here's an example of a community scale photovoltaic system, um, uh, a large PV system on top of uh, the uh, Georgia Tech Aquatic Center, providing far more electricity than is needed by that particular building and feeding it back into the local grid. Other regional scale um, wind uh, energy generation systems. Oh. The problem is, is that, that uh, too often we try to implement these uh, systems on the wrong scale. So uh, 
some of my clients uh, in New York City say, well, you know, I want to put uh, uh, photovoltaic panels on the spandrel of my building, of my high-rise building. Problem is, is that uh, there are other high-rise buildings in the neighborhood and they cast shadows on your building. And um, also when you locate at 40 degrees north latitude, your photovoltaic panels in a vor vertical orientation, they produce on an annual basis about 30% less energy than they would if they were optimally configured. So sloping, uh, facing south and at a 40 degree slope above horizontal. Also, we get clients that say, I want to put a, a wind uh, turbine on top of my high rise building. Once again, not a very good utilization of capital. So I tell these clients what they should do instead of put a photovoltaic panels on their spandrel panel on their, of their building, they should uh, put a sign that says, my PV system is located on top of a, a big warehouse uh, over in New Jersey where it ought to be, or my wind turbine is located uh, in the Long Island Sound uh, where it gets better wind contact and creates more energy. So we look at transportation in an urban context. This is a study that I did uh, a number of years ago, looking at density versus straw, uh, sprawl, looking at transportation energy use in, and comparing it with energy use in the building. So what we're comparing here is a high rise building in an urban center with uh, 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 an office park uh, in a suburban context uh, with the idea that the commutation, commuting of workers uh, to the urban center uh, occurs with the mass transit, whereas uh, the commuting to the suburban office park occurs with individual automobiles. So if we look at the energy consumption of the buildings, um, the energy consumption of the suburban office building on a per square foot basis is approximately the same as the energy consumption of the high-rise building uh, in the urban center. Uh, clearly, the high-rise building has more energy use for elevators, but on the other hand, it has uh, less of a, of a, of a heat loss uh, through the roof and, uh, and heat gain through the roof. So they're approximately equal. But if we look at the energy consumed by the workers going from home to work every day, uh, we see that the, um, the urban center building, the energy consumption for commuting is uh, slightly greater than the energy consumption for the building itself. But for the suburban office building, the energy consumption is almost six times as great as the energy consumed by the building. And these are the assumptions uh, that the commuting round trip is 50 kilometers. Uh, it's a diesel bus, uh, <clears throat> which consumes, uh, uh, this is for the urban transit, 1.7 uh, kilometers per liter of, of fuel, and there are 20 passengers on the bus. Um, and in the office uh, building, uh, we have uh, 300 square meters per person uh, occupying the building 252 days per year. For the suburban office, same distance commuting, but it's in a private car that gets 6.5 kilometers per liter, but only one person, same occupancy. <clears throat> so solving the issue of, of urban transportation involves how do we deal with the last mile, that is, or and the first mile. So we have uh, in many cities, solved, shall we say, the, the, the urban transit problem with subways and trams 
and electric buses and all sorts of things like that. New York City has a terrific um, subway system, uh, as does as do Atlanta in the U.S., uh, Washington, D.C. But the problem is the first mile, which is getting from your home to the subway, and the last mile, which is getting from the subway uh, to your place of business. And that is the real problem. And that is where we are still seeking a solution. This last mile problem also applies to the distribution of goods within the urban center. Too often in lower Manhattan, we see tractor trailer trucks trying to navigate the very narrow and constricted streets there when in fact, uh, and generating lots of uh, diesel uh, fumes, when in fact uh, that last mile of delivery uh, should be occurring with small electric uh, urban uh, distribution vehicles. The idea then would be to essentially uh, remove all cars and all com internal combustion engine vehicles from the urban center. Energy. We have our community energy issues. <clears throat> we need to be very specific when we identify sources because some of the things that we think of as sources are not sources. Electricity is not a source, it's a product. There is a source that makes electricity and that source might be the sun, the wind or hydro or wave, which is indirectly solar. It could be nuclear, it could be fossil, it could be biodiesel, which is of course indirectly solar energy or it could be geothermal. And by this, I mean real geothermal, not uh, ground coupled uh, thermal storage. We know that we need to look at how we transport energy because in almost all circumstances, the source of the energy is not no co-located with its end use. So we have, uh, sometimes we have connected storage which is would be natural gas pipelines that go directly into our buildings it could be electricity where wires go directly from the 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 generation source the power plant to the end user the building or it could be discrete um, transportation so uh, oil uh, a tank truck comes to your building and fills your oil tank or gasoline where you drive your car to a gas station and fill it and with uh, the hydrogen uh, solutions that we've seen most of those involve for uh, for fuel cell automobiles or vehicles uh, discrete uh, transportation where the vehicle goes to a filling station and uh, the tank is is filled uh, with hydrogen we need to look at the issue of storage and of energy density um, in many circumstances, we need to store energy because we need to disconnect the profile of end-use consumption from the profile of generation. And that's particularly true in the case of renewable energy because most renewable energy sources uh, tend to make energy when they feel like it when the resource is available, when the sun is out, when the wind is blowing, when the tide is flowing, uh, not when you need it. So you need to harvest that energy when the generation is available so that it can be used when needed. Also, when you think about it, um, when you have a discrete uh, transportation of an energy source, you also need storage. So the gasoline tank in your automobile is a form of storage, as is the oil tank uh, that might serve the heating plant for your building. When we look at the storage, uh, energy storage, and the um, technologies that are available, we have batteries, uh, capacitors that store electric energy, we have kinetic energy storage in the form of flywheels and things of that nature. Or we have potential storage, such as the pumped hydro, 
where uh, a pump uh, pumps water uh, to a storage tank that's on a high uh, that is at a high el higher elevation. And when that storage is uh, tapped, depleted, the water essentially runs downhill and turns a turbine uh, to generate electricity. And of course, liquid and gaseous fuels are a form of stir storage. <clears throat> what we see is that when we look at the energy infrastructure, there are a number of conversions that occur, one form of energy to another, from the source to the end use. And we need to look at that conversion efficiency. <clears throat> Cogeneration and district thermal sources are clearly one part of the solution to our energy problem. <clears throat> because we are able to tap the waste heat uh, from the generation of electricity to provide thermal needs. So this is a, a very uh, quick analysis of a combined heat and power plant uh, with uh, a standard a sort of uh, uh, solution whereby the waste heat from the power, electric power generation is wasted, and yet our need for thermal energy uh, is uh, generated by a separate boiler. And so we can see that there's a significant increase in efficiency by utilization of the waste heat uh, from the generation of electricity. When we look at, in the United States, uh, our utilization of energy, and this is a, a diagram from uh, the year 2018, uh, the U.S. energy consumption was 101,000 quadrillion BTUs of energy. Uh, and we look at how energy is used uh, in residential, commercial, industrial, and transportation. And then we look at the rejected energy. Uh, about two-thirds of the source energy that is consumed in the United States is actually rejected. And that's rejection from heat engines, which are used uh, uh, to generate electricity, and rejected heat in a heat engine is a necessary part of the thermodynamic cycle. It's also uh, the rejection of energy, energy uh, for heat engines that are used in transportation, you know, uh, gasoline engines, diesel engines, other types of internal combustion engines, even steam engines necessarily uh, have that thermodynamic requirement for rejection of heat uh, to create work. Um, in the industrial, uh, we have the same issue. So the point is, is that some of the utilization of energy in these sectors, residential, commercial, industrial, not so much transportation, is in the form of heat. And we could be, if we were configured correctly, uh, tapping this rejected energy in the form of heat to meet our thermal heat requirements. So what we need to see in the future going forward is really kind of uh, 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 an internet, shall we say, of energy. Most of you probably are not old enough to remember time-shared computing back in the day, you know, with uh, IBM 3030 uh, uh, mainframe computers and uh, uh, the distribution network for, 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 for computation was entirely radial. That is, you had dumb terminals uh, that uh, connected directly uh, to the mainframe and there was a time sharing uh, sort of uh, arrangement whereby uh, the terminals were served uh, on, on a sequential basis. Um, unfortunately, uh, when uh, the mainframe went down, everybody lost uh, computational resources. Today, we have the internet. 
where computational capability is spread around a network. Uh, there are multiple nodes. There are multiple com connections between the nodes. And you can lose a major node, and no one ever notices the difference because the network shifts to take up the slack. And that's really what we need uh, for our energy infrastructure. Today, unfortunately, in most countries, the energy infrastructure is sort of the energy equivalent of mainframe computer time sharing. We have central <coughs> energy um, generation state, uh, stations, uh, electric generation plants, and when they fail, uh, they can start a, uh, 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 a calamity, uh, and we experienced that on the East Coast about 15 years ago with the great blackout where one power station um, having a problem somewhere in Indiana uh, started a cascade which shut down the entire uh, northeastern quarter of the United States. Um, if a community in energy infrastructure of this nature, as shown on the screen, were implemented, that would not happen. We would have uh, wind generation statement, uh, stations, uh, solar generation, we would have our uh, combined heat and power, we would have waste to energy, and uh, we would be locally utilizing the thermal resources um, from uh, electric generation to meet thermal needs and so on and so forth. And this would be a very robust uh, infrastructure that makes best use of the resources that it consumes while minimizing the generation of waste. And an example from, from a number of years ago, uh, a fuel cell at a uh, uh, casino uh, here in the United States uh, that uses uh, local heat recovery from the electric generation process uh, to meet local thermal requirements. A number of years ago, I was involved in a, a master planning effort for in, in the Middle East, and uh, uh, we were proposing uh, co-located uh, local uh, generation, electric generation statement stations, along with local wastewater treatment um, and, uh, and, and local district cooling. And we were told that that was not possible because in this particular large city in the Middle East, uh, there was no natural gas distribution infrastructure and that they preferred to have uh, natural gas fired um, electric generation stations on the periphery of the city and to distribute uh, over um, ultra high voltage uh, overhead uh, power lines, uh, this electricity, which was generated remotely into the city. So we did a land use um, study uh, for the various alternatives. So we had our extreme high voltage transmission lines with central generation. The overhead right away required uh, for these very high transmission towers into the city was approximately 540 meters wide. The cost of each of the four overhead circuits, uh, 70 megawatts each, was $2 million per kilometer. Uh, the development value of the land was $122.5 million uh, per kilometer uh, for this uh, this uh, alternative. So we have then the uh, other, the second alternative, which was underground electric. Um, we have um, the uh, underground electric uh, corridor would be reduced to 100 meters wide. Uh, for a typical uh, four uh, circuit corridor, the cost would be $20 million for kilo, uh, per kilometer. So the urban land value uh, is uh, $250 uh, per square meter. The, so the land released 
uh, from um, moving from overhead transmission lines to underground electric uh, would be um, $110 million uh, per kilometer. And then we looked at underground gas distributed generation. So the urban corridor would be reduced to 50 meters wide. Uh, and for the typical 24 inch gas line, the installation cost is $250,000 per kilometer. And the land released uh, was valued at $122.5 million per kilometer. So despite the fact that there was no natural gas distribution <clears throat> infrastructure in this large Middle Eastern city, the actual cost of bringing gas in to distributed local cogeneration plants was far less than the cost of building the generation plants on the periphery of the city and then bringing in the power by overhead transmission lines. By the way, the location of the electric generation plants of the, at the periphery precluded the utilization of the waste heat for, from the generation process for things like domestic hot water and, uh, and low pressure uh, desalination. When we look at uh, our dist distributed uh, generation uh, assets that we might utilize, um, we see that they have different characteristics uh, with regard to efficiency, part load performance, uh, size, uh, the amount of space required, the installed cost, the operations and maintenance cost, um, the, uh, the capacity, the fuels that they use, the noise, the NOx generation, and what are the what is the temperature at which they reject heat, uh, which leads to uh, what different types of in uses the waste heat can be put to. So what we can say is that when we are considering a a, a combined heat and power a distributed generation plant. We can look at all of these characteristics uh, to decide what particular technology is appropriate for what particular application. This is uh, just a, a general outline a diagram of a, a combined heat and power uh, plant that I worked on uh, in China uh, several years ago, uh, looking at uh, um, engine uh, generators uh, for uh, electricity, very high efficiency engine generators, and then a utilization of absorption chillers and uh, to, um, um, uh, for making cooling. <clears throat> the next issue uh, in community uh, infrastructure uh, for uh, green cities is solid waste management. Excuse me. We look at uh, the generation, for example, of, of, of plastic wastes uh, in 2010, and we can see that there are uh, a number of uh, countries, including mine, uh, which generate excessive uh, amounts of plastic waste, uh, unfortunately, much of which goes into the ocean. What we need to do is we need to invert the waste management triangle. The currently um, source reduction of waste is uh, has the smallest emphasis. Uh, next, we go to recycling and composting. Uh, then we have a uh, conversion technologies, and finally, the major uh, solution for solid waste in the United States is landfill. Just basically burying it, and getting rid of it. And what we need to do is we need to invert. Uh, this triangle and uh, uh, concentrate on source reduction, then recycling and composting, then conversion technologies. Conversion technologies are essentially waste to energy and then uh, with landfill as the last resort. We need to uh, basically develop an urban waste management strategy 
to enable the separation of the streams of waste uh, for different uh, uh, end uses um, right at the source of generation uh, so that they don't have to be uh, separated later, which is a much more arduous task. <clears throat> I was involved a bit in the planning for Mazdar City, uh, which developed, uh, at least initially, a comprehensive waste management uh, a strategy, wherein 50% um, of the waste stream would go to recycling, 17% uh, would go to composting, uh, some of the non-recyclable would actually go to waste to energy <clears throat> uh, after um, the uh, hazardous uh, waste had been removed uh, with the idea that the city develops uh, into a zero waste city. Water. We have here the natural water cycle. Um, unfortunately, Water in a form that is uh, suitable for human utilization represents only a very small part of this water cycle. Uh, typically, uh, we utilize water from underground or from freshwater um, surface assets uh, to meet our water needs. But the great majority of water on the planet is stored either in oceans where it is saline and has to be treated before it can be used by human beings or in the form of water vapor uh, in the atmosphere where it is not really usable. <clears throat> Much of the water that human beings use um, doesn't have to be potable. We need to understand what potability means. Potability uh, is not really a chemical definition of the amount of pollutants in the water. What it is, is a legal definition that there is an authority that is legally responsible for ensuring that human consumption of a particular water resource will not result in harm. So we have instances in the United States, for example, in Flint, Michigan, where there was quote unquote potable water, which had been determined to be harmless by the local water authority, but which was slowly poisoning the residents because of its lead content. Unfortunately, that local authority is now subject to all kinds of liability uh, because they failed in their mission uh, to ensure that the water could cause no harm. So <clears throat> we have our alternative sources of non-potable water available in the city. So we have the city water uh, as a comparator, which has no debris, a very low suspended solids, very low dissolved organics, uh, very low uh, dissolved organics and very low microbia. And then we have different uh, resources that are available at different scales, and they have different characteristics with respect to the various kinds of, of contaminants that they contain. So we have something like HVAC condensate, which is uh, no debris, very low suspended solids, very low inorganics, organics, and microbia, particularly if the cooling coil is irradiated with UVC there will be virtually no microbia at all. This is essentially distilled water. It is very pure, but it is not potable unless you, as the building services engineer, want to uh, deem this water to be fit for human consumption and take on the liability in case uh, something uh, fails in the supply chain for delivering the HVAC condensate to the user. However, if this water is not to be drunk or not to be used for personal hygiene, it is very pure and can be used for many different uh, end uses within the building. And similarly, the other types of, uh, of, uh, of um, 
of non-potable uh, sources uh, within the, the community have different types of use. So we look at matching the sources with the end use. So our city water, primarily ingestion, secondary use personal hygiene, HVAC condensate, we can use that for flushing toilets, we can use that for domestic hygiene, washing clothes, potentially washing dishes. Um, <clears throat> stormwater, use it for flushing, cooling tower makeup. Stormwater on grade, irrigation, wet wash water uh, could be used for uh, irrigation. If it's not stored, unfortunately, wash water, if it's stored because of its uh, uh, <clears throat> relatively high or dissolved organic content, uh, tends to um, grow bacteria <coughs> and become fetid, to become smelly, in fact, to become effectively black water. So if you use wash water in the context of trickle irrigation, then in fact, uh, that could be its primary use. Uh, cooling tower blowdown uh, has uh, a lot of contaminants, but it can be processed. Uh, with reverse osmosis uh, to produce uh, very high quality water that can be used for things like flushing and cooling tower makeup. Treated black water, that is sewage treatment, potentially can be used for cooling tower makeup and for irrigation. And what we need and what we want to have is an improved water, uh, urban water cycle where there is no waste disposal into the surface water bodies, and whereas the various non-potable end uses are for the most part met with the non-potable resources that are available within the community. What are the community scale uh, treatment uh, uh, alternatives as a so-called uh, local uh, wastewater treatment, where we have very small local wastewater treatment uh, uh, stations that enable uh, the <clears throat> utilization of the treated fluid sewage effluent for local uses such as irrigation and potentially uh, flushing. <clears throat> the DWATCH, Decentralized Wastewater Treatment System, is the prime example of this, which can be implemented on a neighborhood scale, uh, resulting in uh, um, significant uh, reduction in the utilization of city water uh, for, um, uh, for human use. And utilization, this is a uh, DWATS finishing bed, uh, a, a, a local uh, park amenity that is entirely irrigated uh, from the treated sewage effluent from the, um, from the, the uh, DWATS. And this is a case study uh, for, um, for water uh, uh, optimization uh, and reuse of uh, non-potable resources. The Godred headquarters in Mumbai, I worked on that, this building and particularly on this. This was the design comprehensive water harvesting system to try to make use of all the different uh, uh, non-potable assets on site, um, including uh, harvesting of the foundation drain water uh, and treatment with a reverse osmosis uh, a system because the, the foundation drain water uh, was relatively saline because uh, this particular project is located pretty uh, close to the mangrove swamp, which is saline water. Also uh, harvesting through the reverse osmosis system of the cooling tower blowdown. It included a packaged uh, sewage treatment plant uh, and uh, harvesting of roof storm water uh, and with allocation of these different assets to the appropriate end use. Um, these were our uh, projections for the uh, design uh, usage, uh, a total in the building of about 360,000 liters per day. And we were proposing that that would be met by about 125,000 liters per day from the city and the rest of the energy consumption, or excuse me, of the water consumption in the building for non-potable uses would be met by these various uh, non-potable assets. 
Unfortunately, the design changed uh, 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 at some point uh, during during construction documents. The reverse osmosis treatment plant was deleted. There was some downsizing of the rainwater harvesting tanks. With a result, however, um, of a significantly greater, greater utilization of potable water from the city, but still uh, about 40% of the of the uh, water uh, that's used in the building comes from non-potable resources, from the um, the black water treatment, from the uh, stormwater um, uh, harvesting, uh, et cetera. There is a guideline for green uh, communities to lead for neighborhood development, which has been evolving uh, to recognize uh, the synergies uh, between the various infrastructure systems in the community. And so here are the conclusions that I've arrived at. It's possible to achieve dramatic reductions in carbon footprint by optimizing pedestrian and mass transit at a community scale. Community scale power distribute or generation enables doubling of efficiency of plants through waste heat utilization. Local siting of wastewater treatment plants provides a valuable source of water for non-potable uses. Greenscape integrated into the urban environment is a powerful strategy for optimal stormwater management. Community design is a powerful tool for environmental responsibility. The bottom line, the world will be saved not by building millions of lead platinum buildings, but by building thousands of sustainable communities. Thank you. So I don't know how we're handling questions, but or, or whether we have time. But uh, if we do, I think let's see if I can um, I can enable the chat here so that I can see. Uh, any questions that might be asked. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, that was a fantastic session. So um, let me just looking at the questions here. Uh, Akshay, Mani, are you available? Akshay? Yeah, hi. Uh, one more. Hi, Akshay. Uh, uh, can you help me? I'm not seeing any questions in the tab. I, I'm also trying to look at that. Um, let me just check with Money once if he can. I see he's offline. Uh, can, okay, we'll just yeah, give him I'm a just giving up. Give me a second. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, Daniel, I have a question myself. Uh, when you said the uh, one of the ways to uh, cut down carbon footprint is by, uh, you know, having um, community, you know, uh, what do you call it? Uh, mass community, uh, you know, sort of pedestrian sort of outreach. So, how does that exactly uh, help in uh, putting down the carbon footprint? Like I, what, what I'm trying to understand is uh, when you're looking at the more number of uh, buses or say, um, you know, uh, trains and stuff. So uh, wouldn't that also add to the carbon footprint as well? The answer is yes. Um, increasing the number of buses does add to the carbon footprint. But if you look at the carbon generation per mile per person, Okay. Mass transit is has a much lower uh, impact than does utilization of automobiles. Automobiles mm -hmm. carry only one or two persons typically, whereas mm -hmm. a bus contains 20 or 30. And despite the fact that, let's say, the the um, the uh, mileage rating of the bus might be one third to one quarter of the mileage rate of the uh, uh, mileage ratio of, of the automobile, if the bus is carrying 
10 or uh, 20 times as many people as the car, clearly that is a, a reduction uh, in the total carbon footprint for moving uh, people. That is, carbon footprint per passenger mile is much okay. less uh, with mass transit than with uh, individual automobiles. New York City, for example, which has a relatively low uh, commute, commuting by car and very high commuting by electric train and subway, has a very low carbon footprint for transportation compared with other cities in the United States uh, that rely primarily on automobiles for transporting people uh, between home and work, between home and shopping, between home and, and, and chores. Um, and that is uh, very much borne out by uh, the data about uh, the New York City uh, carbon footprint. For transportation, it's very low because it relies of primarily on um, electric uh, buses, or excuse me, electric trains and subways for commuting. Okay, so I think I have my answer here. So I just start to uh, the questions by the contestants. Uh, we have first question is why is the underground transmission so high? Uh, under, underground transmission line is high by Mohammed Sahid. Wait, 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 could you repeat that a little more slowly? I couldn't quite pick it up. Yeah, uh, why underground transmission line is so high? Okay, so I'm not an electrical engineer, I'm a mechanical engineer. So, um, the there's something about uh, 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 currents that are induced in um, wet soil uh, by the alternating, the high uh, voltage alternating current in the underground line, which mm -hmm. uh, causes that underground line to be uh, expensive. And I don't understand it. It's that's not my area of expertise. We just got a um, uh, an estimate uh, for the cost uh, per kilometer of underground line. Uh, the um, overhead line, of course, includes the towers and the conductors. The underground line did include the uh, the excavation and the the material for and uh, for the line itself and putting it in place. Um, the uh, I guess because of the ground shielding, uh, the uh, right of way for the underground line was much narrower. Uh, clearly, people don't want to live or work underneath um, <coughs> uh, ultra high voltage uh, electric distribution lines there's some funny things that 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 may happen there in terms of in induced currents and that sort of stuff um once again not my field of expertise but but uh, the assumption that we made was that uh, the corridor for the overhead line would would uh, conform to uh to uh, electric utility standards um the corridor for the underground transmission line was uh, once again uh, in accordance with electric utility standards and the estimate for the actual construction of the uh, electric lines uh, you know was done by our um, cost estimator based on on specifications uh, uh, from the electric utilities okay uh, so i'll move on to the next question how do, how do you advise for a house to be zero waste production by Prashant Dubey? So how do we make what zero waste production? A house. A house. A house. I don't think that that can be done on a um, 
on a house by house basis. I think that that's, that's a community endeavor. Uh, actually, it's more than that. It's just, it's a, it's a, actually an endeavor of of uh, of of an entire uh, uh, economy. So as we said, um, the the first most important uh, um, strategy uh, for uh, dealing with the solid waste problem is to reduce the amount of solid waste that's dem that is generated. And primarily, that is around packaging. And so we all consume products that are packaged. Uh, some of that packaging is cardboard. Some of that's plastic. We need to be much better about our packaging, making it either all recyclable or, in some cases, reusable. You know, uh, when I was a little child, uh, milk was delivered to our house in glass bottles that were reused. And so when we were done with the glass bottle, we put it out on our doorstep and the milkman uh, collected the empty bottle. It was taken back to the milk distribution plant where the bottle was sterilized and refilled. And then the milk was delivered, you know, the next day. So for a lot of reasons that practice went away. But we need to think about, you know, what is the 21st century version of, of that practice? How can we reuse? Because um, reuse is much better than recycling, because recycling basically uh, uh, means that the uh, material uh, or the product, the packaging product, essentially will be um, will be reprocessed and made into a new form, which requires uh, energy and, uh, um, and uh, uh, I mean, we look at recycled aluminum. We have to, while we don't have the uh, energy consumption of, of uh, refining the bauxite into aluminum, we still have the energy consumption of taking the aluminum pan and melting it so that, uh, um, that it can be made into a new product. Whereas if we had some type of, of, of uh, packaging for liquid that could be just refilled, we would entirely avoid the, um, the uh, we would entirely avoid uh, the energy consumption of, uh, of, of reprocessing that, uh, that, uh, that uh, packaging product. So that's actually a, a a solution that involves the entire economy, but you know, from a uh, from a house standpoint, let me just finish by saying, selecting your products according to their packaging, uh, doing your uh, composting, uh, and uh, and being very diligent about uh, separating what is recyclable from what is not is is a good start. And then what we need to do is to make sure that the stream of uh, potential waste uh, that comes into your house uh, falls more into the categories of reusable, recyclable, and compostable, and less into the category of the only thing we can do with this is put it in the landfill. Okay, uh, so I'll go to the next one. I'm seeing a lot of questions on the pandemic and how it, has it accelerated the growth of sustainable architecture? And uh, if you can shed any light on that. Wait, wait, could you say that again? Uh, can you shed some light on the uh, pandemic and whether it has accelerated the growth of sustainable architecture? Okay, so has the, the pandemic accelerated? How has the pandemic accelerated the growth of sustainable architecture? Is that the question? Yes, that is. Well, I'm not sure. I, I think it's too early to say. I think I think the pandemic has um, definitely brought a focus onto the issue of indoor air quality. Um, 
I don't know that that's that particular issue falls into the the uh, the topic of this particular presentation, but it it definitely um, uh, falls into the issue overall of 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 building sustainability. Um, I've been doing work with uh, some of my uh, clients about looking at uh, exactly how we can configure um, HVAC systems uh, to minimize the potential uh, for uh, communication of, of uh, disease uh, vectors uh, within the indoor environment, looking at airflow patterns within rooms, looking at what are ways that, uh, that we can uh, use to remove pathogens from the airstream. Um, so, you know, I think from that standpoint, that's a very immediate um, impact. I, I'm not sure how it's going, what, what are going to be the impacts, you know, going forward. Uh, I think there will be some. I just, I'm not wise enough to know what they are yet. I'm only aware of the more immediate ones. Okay. Uh, so the next question is how would one incorporate sustainable communities in old cities where much of the infrastructure is already built on a non sustainable model? Okay. This is an interesting issue that came up. I was doing some work in Costa Rica a number of years ago, and um, Costa Rica has a real problem. Uh, they get all of their water from wells, and um, the 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 water level is dropping at a very rapid rate. And so you go to their capital city, and you see why they get all their water from wells because the city has no sewage infrastructure whatsoever. Basically, sewage from individual buildings comes out of the building in a trench and goes into a trench that runs along the side of the road. And that is both stormwater runoff and raw sewage. And it smells, and you, you know it's raw sewage. So, uh, a number of years ago, they decided to improve this uh, structure. By the way, this sewage runs directly into the surface water features, which are basically <coughs> the uh, the system of streams and the main river that runs through the city. So raw sewage is going directly into the river. And so as a result, the river is not a good source of water uh, to meet the needs for the city. So they get all the water from well. A few years ago, they decided to improve this system. And so they, they lined these trenches with concrete, which basically did two things, neither of them good. Number one, it removed the ability of the plants, which were previously growing in these trenches, uh, to process some of the organic material out of the sewage stream. It also um, completely eliminated the possibility that some of the water uh, would percolate through the soil um, and be cleansed by the natural filtering action of the percolation to provide some replenishment of the aquifer. So, they were very at, at, at odds about how to deal with this situation, uh, realizing that um, to um, deploy, to create uh, uh, the entire sewer infrastructure for the city would cost billions of dollars uh, and would, uh, or at least hundreds of millions of dollars, and would uh, require uh, years before they would get any benefit. However, we pointed out that uh, deployment of a DWATS uh, distributed uh, wastewater treatment system 
on a neighborhood by neighborhood basis, essentially uh, installing the uh, natural cycle sewage treatment uh, in the streets, underneath the streets, in um, uh, in caissons that would be that would be uh, that would be excavated under the street and then paving back over and then collecting uh, from individual neighborhoods would allow this process of creating a sewer infrastructure to proceed in a piecemeal basis, getting individual benefit uh, as each step was. Um, was finished. So the idea here is is that to realize uh, that, and for example, uh, uh, talking about uh, let's say the 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 plan uh, for um, co-located uh, district cooling um, uh, generation and wastewater treatment uh, for this Middle Eastern city, that could have been um, pursued on a neighborhood by neighborhood basis. So the idea is, is that when you have these uh, integrated solutions, they can, to the extent that they are, uh, and most of them are uh, appropriate at a neighborhood scale, they can be pursued on a piecemeal basis, uh, taking neighborhood by neighborhood uh, to create the improvement. Okay, uh, so I'll take this last question. Um, what is the source, major source of greenhouse gases and how do we measure on infrastructure basis for green communities? Well, the major source of greenhouse gases varies from place to place. So uh, in many US cities, the majority of greenhouse gases are generated by transportation which is cars trucks and buses and that sort of thing all of which are using internal combustion engines in new york city 70 percent of the greenhouse gas generation comes from buildings and that's because number one new york city for the most part is so dense and number two uh, much of the transportation uh, comes from is, is mass transit and there's much less utilization of cars within the city limits of, uh, <coughs> of New York. So uh, the individual solutions for uh, reducing greenhouse gases is going to vary from location to location. So for example, um, I, I'm not familiar with cities in India and what are the primary sources for greenhouse gas generation in Indian cities. Um, I think that's, you know, you, you, the, you'll have to find that data and then try to craft solutions that address the very specific issues in each city. I know that in many U.S. cities, for example, Houston, <clears throat> the issue there is transportation. It's cars. Everybody is uh, going everywhere in a car, and typically there's only one person in each car. So they have a really big problem of trying to create a uh, a low greenhouse gas public transportation system, uh, not only solving uh, the issue of the major travel distances for the um, for the, the the mass transit system getting from the suburbs to the city center, but also the first and last mile issues, which is how do the people get uh, from their homes to the mass transit station, and then how do they get from the mass transit station to their place of work uh, when they get to the city? So um, the answer is, I'm, I'm sorry to say, it, it, it depends on, on where you are 
and how your city is configured and 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 what uh, are the 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 systems that are generating a greenhouse gas in your city okay uh, so i think uh... I think um, all of you can uh, send your uh, questions to Mr. Daniel. I, I think uh, thanks, Daniel, for giving me an opportunity. So I'll hand it over to Akshay for taking it forward. Akshay, it's all yours. Yeah, thanks, An Anmol. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Akshay Pahade, CTTC Chair from Ashri Pune Chapter. Hope you all had a great time learning from the webinar today. And thank you, Mr. Nal, for joining us today and giving us insights in the real world challenges in implementation of technologies in community development and planning. Thank uh, you. The examples, the examples you shared, especially in the context of energy and water were exhaustive, elaborate, and yet in easier to comprehend. From the basic principles to advances in technology, you covered it all and also gave insights in context of community development. I'm sure our attendees today have benefited a lot from this session. Uh, and also the question answer session was uh, very insightful. And I hope that most of the you know, uh, you know, questions were answered adequately. In case you have any more questions, you can get in touch with any of us and we'll uh, you know, pass it on to our speaker for today. Uh, on behalf of Ashray Pune, Ashray Chandigarh, and Ashray Deccan chapters, I thank you all for joining us today. In case you missed uh, any of this presentation, you can access it later at the YouTube channel of Ashri Chandigarh. Also, if you have any questions or queries regarding today's presentation or would like to join Ashri or get more information about your local chapter, please get in touch with any of us and we'd be glad to help. Uh, I would also like to uh, you know, extend the special thanks for the organizing committee today, CTTC Chair of Ashray Chandigarh Chapter, Mr. Mani Khanna, YA Chair, Mr. Akshay Kumar, CTTC Chair of Deccan Chapter, Mr. Anmol Prabhu and Mr. Anuj Gupta, uh, the Chapter Presidents from Pune, Mr. Vikas Kotian, from Chandigarh Chapter, Mr. Amardeep Singh, and from Deccan Chapter, Mr. Sandeep Galhotra, and all others who have directly or indirectly contributed in ma making this session successful. I now declare that the session has uh, is concluded. Stay safe, follow necessary guidelines for social distancing and take care of your health. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you. Take care.